الله تعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نون والقلم وما يسترون ما أنت بنعمة ربك بمجنون وإن لك لأجر غير ممنون وإنك لألا خلق عظيم صدق الله صدق الله المولى الرسيم بلغ الأولى بكماله كشف الدجا بجماله حسن الجميع واختصاله صلوا عليه وآله Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, I deem it a great pleasure and a privilege to have been given this opportunity of coming to speak to you on this auspicious occasion after the birthday of Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu. Our dear children, they seem to have stolen the thunder out of me. You know, everything I wanted to say, it seems that they have said it better than what I could have said. Now, one thing that Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu would have been happy about if he was here with us was to hear us talking about his mentor, his teacher, his guide, the Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that I am the city of knowledge and Ali is the gate, the doorway to that city. This city, our Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is his university, Hazrat Ali's university. And Allah Bari Ta'ala testifies in the ayah I read to you from Surah Al-Kalam. Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَا أَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَزِيمٍ So most certainly thou, O Muhammad, standest on the highest pinnacle of behavior. Now we Muslims, we testify to this fact that the greatest man that ever lived is our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is only natural. Every person, he adulates his hero. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is our hero. And if we speak good about him, it is understood. It is accepted. But if the testimonies come from the enemy, then it is real testimony indeed. If the enemy testifies with regards to the greatness of our Nabi, then that is real testimony, real glorification. And in that field, in this city of New York, a certain Michael H. Hart, described as an astronomer and a mathematician and a historian, he published a book, this book here, called The Hundred. 
the hundred, the hundred most influential men in history. How many of my brothers have read this? Please put up your hands. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Generally, we Muslims are not a reading people. <laughs> you know, the first word of revelation, Wahi, that Allah Ta'ala gives our Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was Iqra, read, or proclaim, or recite. And we are a people who are a Laikra community. Allah says, Iqra, read, and we would say, Laikra, we won't read. <laughs> no, no, we don't say that. That is kufr. But in our behavior, we are a Laikra community. We are not a reading people. Our MC, he told us just now, so many books have been written on the life of Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu. How many of us read it? This book, this book, Najul Balagha, the peak of eloquence, the height of eloquence, the acme of perfection of eloquence. How many of Muslims own this book? <coughs> mashallah, mashallah. We can do better. We can do better, inshallah. So in this book here, this American, in America, he publishes this book of 572 pages. When he published it in 1978, it was retailed at $15 each. It was a lot of money then. And the market for this book would be the Jews and the Christians of America. They didn't, he didn't expect that the Bangladeshis and the Pakistanis and the Saudis and the Egyptians and the Lebanese and the Palestinians to buy this book. No, no, he didn't expect. His main customers are the Jews and the Christians. The 250 million Americans, they would be his main customers. And in this book, he's provoking his customers. Amazing. You see, in business we are told that the customer is always right. You appease the customer. You carry favor with the customer. This man, he goes against that rule and he out of the list of 100 great men, most influential men in history, from Hazrat Adam alayhi salam up to today, he chooses 100 names. Then he evaluates their position. Out of these 100, who should be number one? Who should be number 10? Who should be number 40? Who should be 99? He puts them, and he gives reasons. Why he's putting this one, why this is number three, why that is number ten, he gives reasons in his book. It's not just out of mere prejudice. He wants to justify to his readers why he puts different persons in different positions. And he puts our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam number one. Oh. And he puts his own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, number three. Now that is the shocking thing. His own God, Jesus, his Savior, Jesus, he puts his God number three. And he's provoking the Christians. His customers, the 250 million Americans, mostly Christians and Jews. And he's provoking the Jews. He puts Moses number 40. <laughs> Isn't it shocking? But he justifies, he justifies the most influential man in history, number one is Muhammad Allah testifies, and a Christian confirms it makes us happy. But the skeptics would say, maybe, maybe some Arab had bribed this fellow. No, no, this is human nature. You see, our Arab brethren are generous. No, no, they are generous. You know, we read stories about them in the, in the media, either true or false, but there's always something coming along that one of our brothers went to the Australian waters to catch blue marlin. It's a fighting fish. It, you know, when you hook it, it almost comes out of water as if it's flying. Blue marlin fish. 
And the person who helped to bait the hook, he gave each person $2,000 each for helping him to bait the hook. He didn't catch anything, but he gave $2,000 each. No, no, this is, this is generous. Allah has given it to him and he's spending. He's spending. So what is there for him, for such brothers, generous brothers, to tell Michael H. Hart, he said, look, I give you $10,000, put my Rasul number one. I say it's possible, it's possible, but not probable. It wouldn't enter the mind of the Iranian or an Arab to do such a thing. It wouldn't enter, he wouldn't do it. It might enter his mind, but he won't do it. The fact is that he evaluates, he says, look, Jesus Christ, he puts his God number three because the credit of Christianity, he said, goes to Paul. Paul is the real founder of Christianity. Actually, when we have any discussions, any dialogue with the Christians, and we are at loggerheads on anything, any aspect, you will find that the Christian is quoting something from his Bible, but he quotes from the book of Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians, Thessalonians, we never heard these names, you never heard them, don't worry. <laughs> so you ask, who is this? Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians. He says, Paul, 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 Paul. Nobody ever quotes Jesus. None of them they quote Jesus. What does your Lord and your Master, your God, what does He say? He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except your righteousness and your good deeds exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jews. The Jews, they kept the laws and the commandments. You, my followers, you must keep the laws and the commandments, but on a higher level. They kept to the letter of the law, you must also have the spirit with you. At every step, he said, he is not of me, he said, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Meaning, the responsibilities which I carry, you carry your responsibilities. But now, nobody quotes Jesus. Nobody quotes him. They quote Paul, 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 Paul. So this man is honest enough to admit that the real founder of Christianity is Paul and not Jesus. Therefore, he is given the third position. His God goes number three. Then in the Times Magazine, July 15, 1974, there were a series of essays under the heading, Who are History's Great Leaders? In the Time magazine, uh, the American magazine, Time, Time. Who are History's Great Leaders? And different people were asked this question. Military men, philosophers, psychologists, everybody is asked, what do you think? Who do you think? And everyone, according to his knowledge and experience, he gives his candidate. Everybody is asked, who do you think is the greatest leader in your estimation? So the man gives. And among them, there is a William McNeil, a United States historian of the University of Chicago. He says, if you measure leadership by impact, this man heart by influence. He's talking about the most influential man. But if you measure leadership by impact, then you would have to name Jesus, number one, his God and Savior. Buddha, number three, Muhammad. He puts our Nabiya Karim Sarasam number three. We have no arguments with him. We, have, we can't blame him for doing that. See his prejudice, he's born, he's born in Christianity, he's worshipping his Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus and Buddha is not dangerous. You know, Buddhism is a religion, very peaceful religion. But now, it is not a threat to Christianity in any way. So he puts Buddha number two and he puts our Nabi Karim Sarsan number three. Then there's a James Gavin, who is described as a United States Army man a retired lieutenant general, he says, among leaders who have made the greatest impact through ages, I would consider 
نمبر ون محمد his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Number two, maybe Lenin, possibly Mao, as for a leader whose qualities he could most use now, I would choose John F. Kennedy. But now, number one, our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa Who bribed him? No, we won't ask who bribed him. Maybe, maybe some Arab also bribed the fellow. <laughs> <laughs> then there is Jews, Masterman, in that list. Different, different theses. People are giving now this man, Jules Marsman, he's uni discovered United States psychoanalyst and professor of the Chicago University. He says that before you confer greatness upon any individual, we must first find out what we are looking for in the man. The others are just out of saying, right, this one, number one, number two, but this man says no. He's a psychoanalyst. He wants to analyze things. We must find out what we are looking for in the man. Number one, number one, he said that person, whoever he is, he must be interested in the welfare of the lead, the one he's leading. He's interested in your welfare, not in milking cows for himself, like Reverend Jim Jones in, Brit in Jonestown, Ghana. If you know, if you remember the suicide cult in Jonestown, Ghana, you see the American government was on his track and he was on the verge of getting caught out. So he felt the best way out was to commit suicide. And he inspired 911 of his followers and mass 100% to commit suicide. That's great. You know, if you can inspire 100% of the people that are present hmm, to say, look, this is the way. You want to get to heaven? This is the way. Come on. Lemonade laced with cyanide. Drink, everybody. <laughs> To inspire 911 persons to commit suicide, it's a stupendous achievement. You agree? Huh? Making people to, to die to commit suicide, he did it. But in the meantime, they found out that he had deposited in the banks of the world $15 million in his own account. All those, his followers were his milking cows. They were his milking cows, but he was getting caught out of the law, so he committed suicide and made everybody to commit suicide. No. This person, whoever he is, this great leader, number one, he must provide for the welfare of the lead. He's interested in your welfare. Number one. Anybody. But that person must be interested in the welfare of the people he's leading. Number two. That person must provide a social organization in which people feel relatively secure. That's number two quality. Like the Muslims. We are all gathered here. Alhamdulillah. I can't imagine a single Muslim being drunk here. See, if you imbibe alcohol, it produces the devilishness in you. Somehow the other, a little argument, a little uh, irksome from somebody, and you can come to blows. At your Christmas parties, at your wedding parties, at your any other general gathering, wherever there is a drink and gambling, there is also fist cuff. No. This person, whoever he is, he must provide he must create a social organization in which people feel relatively secure. The Muslim Ummah, the most peaceful Ummah among themselves, man, wherever we gather, we don't come to blows or arguments we have, debates we have, and we have come to blows, but not because of the spirit that is in us. It is a lack of the Islamic spirit or tolerance, but otherwise, physically, for the food that we eat or the drinks that we imbibe, no problem. And number three, that that person must provide for unity of belief. We are 1,000 million Muslims in the world today. Almost as a whole, I mean, I, without exception, 1,000 million Muslims. We all believe in the one and only God that there is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we say he's absolutely unique, he has no partners, he has no sons and daughters and our children read out. No brothers and no sisters and no fathers and no mothers. This is Allah. 100% unanimous. And that God is not Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't say that our, he is our God. No, no. He is a servant of God, a messenger of Allah. Unity of belief. We have the same Quran. We have the same Kaaba. We have the same Allah. 
the Qibla direction, one, one, one. We have minor details of different details in which we differ. This little detail here, that little detail there, that's a blessing. But as a whole, unity of belief. With these three standards, he searches history. And he analyzes Louis Pasteur, the guy who discovered the microbe. No sicknesses, disease, microbe, the germs. Louis Pasteur, Frenchman. He analyzes Hitler as a leader. He was great. As a leader, we are not talking about good or bad. That man, Hitler, was able to inspire 90 million Germans to go on the war path. Destiny your destruction. They were prepared to follow him, to march at his behest and command. As a leader, the guy was great. We are not talking about good or bad. He's not talking about good or bad. But as a leader, he analyzes Hitler and Mussolini. And, and, and the Chinese Mao, everybody he analyzes. And he comes to the conclusion, after analyzing all these, according to his three standards, he says, he comes to the conclusion, he said, perhaps the greatest leader of all times was Muhammad. Who combine all three functions, all the three functions, welfare of the led, a social organization in which people feel relatively secure, unity of belief, he says, who, who combine all three functions and to a lesser degree, whatever he did, our Nabi did, he said Moses did the same. Alhamdulillah, he is a Jew. This professor is a Jew. And he says now, whatever our Nabi did, Hazrat Musa salam also did the same. And that gives us an opportunity when we are going to expound at a future date, you know, prophecies from the Bible, the words of Hazrat Musa salam from the Bible, that you know, he prophesied about the coming of our Rasul, like unto him, like Moses. And here is a, a Jew, a professor of the Chicago University, is inadvertently saying that whatever our Nabi did, Moses did the same. But number two, Moses is his own uh, leader, his chief is number two. How did it happen? Again, the skeptic might say that some Arabs must have bribed this guy as well. Not $10,000, man, come on, come on, man. You know, write some nice things about my prophet. I say it's possible, but it's not probable. But going back into history, Thomas Carlyle, in 1840, he delivered a series of talks in England to his Anglican audience. And he spoke about the hero prophet, a hero as prophet. And among all the biblical characters that he knew, Moses, Jesus, David, Solomon, Isaiah, Zechariah, and the 101 prophets mentioned in the Christian Bible. He doesn't select a single one of them. He comes and selects our Nabi Kareem sallam, as his hero prophet. And he pays glowing tributes. He says, the word of such a man, our Nabi, is a voice direct from nature's own heart. Men do and must listen to that as to nothing else. All else is wind in comparison. Rubbish. Garbage. As the American would say. It's all garbage. Compared to what this man, Muhammad wasallam, is talking, so everything else is garbage. <laughs> and he's telling his audience before he starts his lecture, he wants to put them at ease. Because his nation and the European as a whole, they were trained as he says, to hate the man Muhammad and his religion. They were trained to hate one guy by the name of a, a, a Dutchman, a great writer of his time, Grotius by name. He wrote a book, like this Rushdie fellow. But he wrote a book on the life of our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in that book he wrote that, you see, Muhammad, he trained pigeons. Pigeons, you know, duck, pigeons. To come and pick up peas from his ears. He used to put peas in his ears, and he trained the pigeon to come along, sit on his shoulder, and mm, 
mm, that is looking for the pea, and it finds the pea, it eats it up. And that is that Muhammad gave out to the world as the Holy Ghost coming and speaking to him. Because in his Bible it says, the Holy Ghost came like a dove on Jesus when he was baptized in the river Jordan. So he said that Muhammad did the same. He told the people that the Holy Ghost, Jibreel, Akhi Jibreel, coming like a dove, he sits on his shoulder, and then he picks up the peas from his ears, and uh, he said, you see, that's how he said he was inspired. So, uh, Pop Cocky, Pop Cocky, another writer of his time, is asking the guy, where did you get this from? You know, some authority in the Quran, in the Hadith, in any Islamic books, where did you get this information? He says, no, from nowhere. <laughs> then he says, why did you write this? He said, no, I just felt like it. <laughs> This, 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 they were, they were trained to hate our Nabi and Islam. They were trained. At that time in 1840, this man, Thomas Carlyle, he chooses our Nabi Karim Sallallahu as his hero prophet. We are asking who bribed him when the Muslim world was down in the gutters. There's the whole Muslim world was down in the gutters, subjugated all over. Except for three or four countries like Iran, Afghanistan, and one or two other countries independent. Otherwise, every other Muslim nation was subjugated by the Christians. At that time in history, Thomas Carlyle testifies that his hero prophet is our Nabi Akarim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some 14 years later, La Martin, La Martin, a Frenchman in 1854. He wrote the history of the Turks. He wrote the history of the Turks. And he got me into trouble. La Martin got me into trouble. Just two months ago. I'm invited to France on a lecture tour by the Muslims. On, on the 16th of September in the morning, I land in Charles de Gaulle Airport, Paris. I said, La Martin got me into trouble. I'll show you how he got me into trouble. He, he was born in 1854, he wrote the book, but he got me into trouble. So I land at the airport and go to the immigration counter, and the guy receives my passport. He sees the valid visa issued by the French embassy in South Africa. On the opposite page is blank, and he stamps it. Charles de Gaulle Airport, 16 September. Then he looks up, and he sees my headgear, and lights begin to flash in his head. <laughs> that this guy is a fundamentalist. <laughs> he is a terrorist. He is a fanatic. Yeah, this lights, this, this guy here, this uniform. So, now what to do? He doesn't look like the normal types of guys that come along, the Algerians, the Moroccans, clean-shaven, bareheaded. <laughs> Same thing happens here. J.F. Kennedy, J.F. Kennedy Airport. As soon as I arrived, same process. Passport, another pa passport, visa is there, valid visa. So he stamps it and he looks up. Me, my son and my grandson, we all have a headgear. So he wants to know, so what is this for? He's not trying to be funny. He wants to know, what is this for? I said, no, this is my identity. I'm a Muslim. He said, what is a Muslim? No, no, Allah, he's not trying to be funny. You think the guy is trying to be funny? No, no. He's sincerely wanting to know, what is a Muslim? I said, you know, we are 1,000 million Muslims in the world. We follow the religion of Islam. He said, there's anything about that. An American officer of the American government, educated man, he knows nothing about Islam and about the Muslims. <coughs> this now attracts him. He says, what is this? Why, why you got this? Is this the this, this uniform of a terrorist or of a fanatic or a fundamentalist or what? What are you? What do you stand for? We know the Jews, they have some little caps at the back. <laughs> no, little, 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 little. But this thing here is something unusual. You know, it's much bigger. And it covers your whole head. Everybody's whole head is covered. <laughs> then something clicks and says, Muslims, you people don't need the pig. I said, no, no, we don't need the pig. <laughs> she said, why? Look, he's a busy man. But look, he's hungry. He wants to know. 
Why? I'm thinking tens of thousands of Pakistanis have went through him. He went through them. Tens of thousands of Iranians he's went through. And the Moroccans and the Algerians and the Saudis. All. But it didn't strike him at all. Why? Because all these tens of thousands that come into America, you have no identity. You have no identity. This guy, I'm getting into trouble because of my identity. It's a blessing. Well, this to me, it was also a blessing. What happened there? So, what I'm suggesting to my brothers, you know that we want to have a, a, a Islamic state. We want to have an uh, established, you know, what do you want to establish here? Khilafat. Khilafat. I said, very good, I'm for it, my brothers, I'm for it. But these soldiers, you, my soldiers, I want you to identify yourself. I want you to identify that you are a Muslim. Damn it all, in the streets I can't make you out, who's who? I can't wish you salams. But my brother there, he looks like a Frenchman. Or he looks like an Italian. Or he looks like a Greek. Am I right? Or a Spanish, you pass for anything. <laughs> yes, you, 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 you. you. <laughs> no, no, any, you pass for anything, you know? I said, look like a Greek, you look like an Italian, you look like anything, you can pass. Like a Jew, you know? <laughs> yeah, there's nothing except the Jews also look like in a straight nose now, you know? No more those polynoses, you know, they're all mixed up with... <laughs> so, then you, you can, the guy just right. he stamps here, passport, passport, passport. You come for nothing. As soon as you have an identity, the person is interested in you. What do you stand for? Your uniform, this is your uniform. My uniform. In the, in the aeroplane from Chicago to here, the, the hostess is asking, what is this for, sir? Why you got this? He said, no, we are Muslims, this is our identity. Look, they're asking us. Genuinely, they want to know. But you don't want to be recognized. And you want to establish us. The Khilafah. Khilafah. You, my soldiers, you want to establish Khilafah. Huh? When you are terrified to own up that you are a Muslim and you want to have a Khilafah. What are you talking about? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Learn to identify yourself, man. And opportunities, wallah, is creating opportunities. You, 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 my brothers, you want your wives and daughters and sisters to have the hijab. Huh? Yes. Everybody must have hijab. And you, you don't want to be identified even as a Muslim. Nobody is telling you to have a, 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 a moon and star, you know, tattooed on your forehead. <laughs> Nobody is telling you that. But something simple, man, ordinary. The most harmless thing. And this identity gives you power. It will give you power, wallah. Everybody. We are 800,000, I'm told, in New York, Muslims. So they say, you know, if you only identify yourself, you'll appear like 8 million. Do you know that? In the streets, in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, wherever they see, white cap, white cap, white cap. Say, there's an invasion taking place. How, do, how does the American government allow these people to come in? So many. Huh? Look at them, look at them. The Afro-American, the Iranian, the Saudi, everybody, Pakistani. Everybody has got something on. Identity, identity. It terrifies the enemy and it boosts your morale. We didn't know we are so many Muslims here. But no, 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 you won't do it. I know. You inflict it on your wives and daughters. Hijab! Hijab! MashaAllah! MashaAllah! I'm for it, my dear brothers. I'm for it. But uh, what are you ashamed of? I want to know. Why are you ashamed to identify yourself? You want your wives and daughters to get a bashing? Nobody's bashing them. Why are you afraid that you'll be bashed? Somebody's going to hit you on the head for wearing this. No. Identity. So this Frenchman, he saw this identity and he saw this is something unusual. All the Moroccans come, clean shaven and no hat. All the Tunisians come, clean shaven and no hat. All the Algerians come there, clean shaven, no hat. Right, they pass, they pass, they pass. This guy is something unusual. So he types my name on the computer and he finds me there. And it followed. <laughs> Three hours of interrogation. He wrote my whole history, they wrote my history. And they kept me for 11 hours and pushed me back to London and all the trouble they gave me. Why, why? A nuclear power. The land of liberty, fraternity, equality. You know that? The French Revolution. They boast about liberty, fraternity, equality. 
that nation is terrified of this hat. <laughs> huh? Why? No, they had a reason. You see, these books of mine, I have been writing books. I have been writing books. Books on subjects like what the Bible says about Muhammad Now, I translated that into French. I translated it into French. Mm -hmm. From English to French. Muhammad the natural successor to Christ in English. Translated into French. My book. Muhammad the Greatest, translated into French. My book, Al-Quran, The Miracle of Miracles, translated into French. And all my books, translated into French. And I haven't got a French market in South Africa. What do I do? So I want to send to people in France. So I'm looking for addresses. Somebody gives me a list of 300 addresses of Muslims in France. So, 300 parcels, 15 to 20 books each. Everybody I airlift to into France. And they land in France at the customs. <coughs> All identical, 300 parcels. There's something to think about. None they're French are on the ball, they are alert. There's something going on, man. Three identical parcels, 300 identical. Mm, you never get 300 identical parcels at any time. Identical. All. Have a closer look. Muslim, 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 Muslim. Huh? There is a conspiracy at work. These Muslims now might want to topple the French government. Hmm? What is inside? So they open the books. They start going through. And they find this Lama team. In Muhammad the Greatest, I have this book. I quote Lamartine, the Frenchman. Now in French, in the French translation, it's in French. Lamartine, in his history of the Turks, 1854. Turks, incidentally being Muslims, he spoke about our Nabi. He said, look, these people, the, the Turks, they are Muslims and they follow the Prophet Muhammad. So he started speaking about our Nabi. He said, look. Who is this man, Muhammad? So he describes in his book, in 1854. He said, if greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are the three criteria of human genius who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad. He is daring you to produce your candidate to compare with this man. Who could dare to compare greatness of purpose, what the man is out to do? What is his goal in life? Allah says, Wa ma arsalna ka illa rahmatan lil alameen. We have not sent you except as a mercy to all the worlds. Alam, world, alameen, worlds. To the whole of creation. This is what he has come for. Wa ma arsalna ka illa rahmatan lil alameen. Greatness of purpose, to reclaim mankind. Freedom from adultery, fornication, from alcohol, from racism, from every sickness is affecting mankind. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Greatness of purpose. Smallness of means with what he starts. His capital. Before he is born, his father dies. By the time he's six, his mother dies. He's doubly often by the time he's six. Then his, his grandfather looks after him, Abdul Muttalib. And within two years he dies. Then he's looking after his uncle Abu Talib's goats. No political party, no royalty to back him up. Nobody there. One man against all men. Smallness of means and outstanding results. One billion Muslims today. If these are the three criteria, three standards of judging human genius who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad. He's daring. He's daring. So, 
producer candidate. He's the one says producer candidate to compare with this man. Then he ends his beautiful tribute by saying, philosopher, I wanna be philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, the restorer of rational beliefs, of a cult without images, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and of one spiritual empire. That is Muhammad. With regards all standards, all standards, whereby human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? Is there? That's his question. Is there any man greater than he? No. Meaning the greatest man that ever lived is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The answer is in the question. <coughs> is there any man? In other words, there is no man greater than Muhammad. The greatest man that ever lived is Muhammad. Now that, the French government couldn't stomach. A nuclear power couldn't stomach that. <coughs> hmm? Anything else, they can handle you. Man. They can handle you. Your terrorists and your fanatics, they can handle. Very well organized. But this is now aiming for the mind. Allah is promising us, He's given you a deen. He said, a deen that is to master, to master, overcome and supersede them all. Kulli, bulldoze them all. Kulli. Whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Judaism, every ism. Islam is destined to master them all. Bulldoze them all. Kulli. And, <laughs> and the Frenchman, he saw the dangers. So they sent all the parcels back to South Africa. And they came, we couldn't understand. Everyone has got a rubber stamp on unknown, 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 unknown. So amazing, so somebody has been playing pranks. You know the man who gave us this list of Muslim names and addresses. 300 out of 300, all unknown. No, 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 no. This is what the French government couldn't stomach. And then it reminded me, this reminds me, of an American. An American, Dr. A Pier Dr. Joseph Adam Pearson. He has written a book <coughs> on the life of our Nabi, on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And <laughs> it is worse than Rushdie. But I don't want to start propagating that damn shit. I don't want to talk to you about it. I didn't want to propagate to tell you. So you know, this guy, <laughs> this doctor, was Joseph Adam Pearson, he has written this, this, this. Now wake up and we'll march in New York and we'll march in Chicago and... Mm, I said, you don't give him prominence. The shit that he excretes in that book of his. Worse than Rushdie. But in that shit, pardon my language, this is America, America, this is America. <laughs> no, in my country I can't talk like that. You Americans, you see, 24 hours a day, you hear this. <laughs> huh? This is mine is very polite. I'm saying in the shit that he excretes, there is a diamond. There is a diamond. Believe me, look. <laughs> there is a diamond. And the diamond is, he says, people who worry, this is Dr. Ad, uh, Joseph Adam Pearson. He says, people who worry about nuclear weaponry falling into the hands of the Arabs, they're worried that one day you'll have the atom bomb. The Islamic bomb, Pakistan, Islamic bomb. Who had Islamic bomb? Hmm? Libya might have it. Iraq nearly had it. And preemptive strike by the Jews that knocked out his atomic plant, Saddam's. You remember? Yes. They are worried that if you can't make one, you might buy one from Korea. That guy, Butros, Butros Ghali, he just, yesterday or so, he was there in, in Korea, telling them, he said, look, allow the Americans to go and inspect his atomic plants. The Korean says, no, we haven't got it, but you, you have no right. They have no right. Huh? Because you've got the big stick, you have the right to tell people, say, look, I want to come and inspect what you're doing in your factories. Huh? You've got the big stick? No, they says, no, go to hell. Go to hell. Come along, talk to us, but you don't go into our plants. So says this guy's here. If you can't make one, you'll buy one from Korea, you Arabs. Hmm? You'll buy one from China. 
and you're going to put it on, throw it onto his illegitimate offspring, Israel. That's what he's worried about, Israel. So he says, people who worry about nuclear weaponry falling into the hands of the Arabs fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has been dropped already. <laughs> it fell. When did it fall? When did it fall? Hmm? My brothers and my sisters, I don't know, you see, I'm, unfortunately, uh, my sisters, we can't see them. It's hard for them to convey to us. I said, you tell me when and where did it fall. If you heard me before, you are disqualified. If you heard me on this topic before, then you're not fair or just. But otherwise, it's open to all. This book of mine, The Choice, hardcover, gold embossed from South Africa, between Islam and Christianity by Ahmad Didat, is yours. Yes, my son? 40 yeah. years, years ago in Mecca, Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu when did it fall? Muhammad was born. It is in that. Born. Who said that? In Who said that? No. Did you hear this from me before? Yes, I did. Right, no good. You disqualified now. You, <laughs> you spoiled everybody's chance. I said, the person who has heard me before, you are not qualified. Can you see? That means you are cheating the others. <laughs> you are cheating the others. He says, it fell the day Muhammad was born. That our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is the atom bomb. Tasbih! They can't, they, this guy realizes it. He is the atom bomb. Our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is the atom bomb. And this atom bomb left the data material of that bomb in the Quran. This is the data material of that bomb. Allah is promising you, He's given you a deen. He said, And He repeats the same ayah, another place in the Quran. He said, He it is who has sent His messenger with guidance, and with the religion of truth, that it may prevail, overcome, and supersede every other deen, every other way of life. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that is going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. <laughs> the data material of that bomb. Even if you had the laser gun, you are disqualified. You know that. Allah says, like Rahafi deen, there is no compulsion in religion. You can't use it. You can't tell any nation, they say, look, if you don't accept Islam, we'll obliterate you, we'll incinerate you. You can't do that. Allah says, like Rafi Din. Then how? How are you going to conquer this world? This giant, mighty America. You know, you look at his Air Force, man. It's terrifying. Well, everything is terrifying. You know that? People come in, I don't know how you people feel, but I get terrified when there's Jenny Kennedy Airport and the LaGuardia Airport and all. Sure. What about that American Airport and shh, and the Dallas Airport and that. Uh, and your Atlanta airport and the Salt Lake, you know, junction. Man, how are you going to conquer these people? Allah says, لِيُزَهِرَ هُوَ لَدِّينَ كُلِّ He's given you a deen, that's to master over and supersede them all, bulldoze them all. How, how are you going to bulldoze this mighty America? You tell me. How? I say with the intellect. Not with a gun. Allah says, no, like Rafid Din, you can't use it even if you had it. You can't use it. It's worthless forcing people to accept Islam at the point of the gun. Worthless. Then how? I say with the intellect. He has given it to you that you can bulldoze every ideology. Here is the data material of that bomb. Talk to him, man. Talk to him. Learn to talk to him. Create opportunities. Talk to the guy. And this guy, the American, is the easiest guy to deal with. He is the easiest guy in this world at the present moment, not the French, not the German, not the British. The American is the fittest guy to receive this message of Islam. He has a complex. He is big. The Texan, you know the Texan? Huh? Yeah, you know the Texan. Texas, Texas is a big, one of the biggest states of yours, is it? And the Texan also feels anything that anybody does, we can do bigger. And he's a giant compared to us, <laughs> most of us from Pakistan and India and Bangladesh, five foot three, five foot six. <laughs> no, 
no, I mean, look, we have been starving, man. We have been starving for thousands of years, living on, you know, rice and some pulses. <laughs> right, this, this is our condition, physical condition. We, we look like pygmies in front of the guy. Yeah? The guy's a giant, man. He is a giant. Physically, he's taller than you. Average, American, am I right? Yes. Yes. The only guy who can compete with him is the Afro-American in size. You know, he's that basketball fellows. And I see them, man, he just, I say, how the guy does it, man? You know, he just puts it there. <laughs> seven footer, everybody is a seven footer. I say, how do you produce them, man? How do, what do you do? What's your secret, you Afro-Americans? Everybody is a seven footer, he just goes and puts it there like that. <laughs> this mighty American. You see, it gives him a complex. He's big, he's big. He's powerful, he's powerful. That gives him the complex. That you little pygmies, what have you got? Come on, come on. Yeah, talk, man, talk, talk. I want to hear you. And a Saudi friend of mine, he discovered the secret. So how to start with these fellows? It's the easiest thing in the world to start with them. He comes from Saudi Arabia. And with his Arabic accent, you know, you can make out he's, he's an Arab. So you know I come from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And I got four wives. <laughs> I got four wives. A sure bait, wallah, is a sure bait for the American. He wants now to get at you. Four wives, you want just people, you like so barbarians, <laughs> he wants to get at you. <laughs> In two minutes time he changes. He said, no, no, what I mean is that I got one wife, but I'm allowed up to four. <laughs> so then, why can't a woman have four husbands? He said, no, no, no. You see, sir, you see, this is a solution to your problem. You have a problem. You see, Islam is offering you a solution. So you see, sir, according to your statistics, you have 7.8 more women than men. 7.8 million more women than men. If every man in America got married, you'll still have 7.8 million women who can't get husbands. That's a fact. To start with, Almost 8 million more women than men, 7.8. That's your exact figure. And of the manpower you have, sir, there are 25 million sodomites. You call them gays. <laughs> Another 25 million women can't get husbands. <laughs> huh? 32 million. If every man got married, which is never going to happen. Man gets cold feet for so many reasons. You know that? This guy's 45 already, is not married. So I said, what's wrong with you? Come on, come on, man. Look, there's a nice lady, you know, widow. She's got some children. Look, get married. And he said, yes, yes. Hmm, he's happy. He's right. I take him there. And by the time he comes to the country, the guy backs out. He gets cold feet. Man, man, gets cold feet for so many reasons. Do you know that? Huh? He's terrified he might not make the grade. He knows. He won't tell me that. But he knows why he doesn't want to, why he backs out. So, 32 million. And your prison population, 98% are males. Your problem is getting compounded, sir. Huh? 32 million, and now your prison population, 98% are males. So, Islam offers you a solution. It says, marry women of your choice by twos and threes and fours, but if you cannot do justice between them, marry only one. It's an answer to your problem. You don't listen to this solution, then you simmer in your soup. You simmer in your soup. Literally, your women folk are going to the dogs. He says, this Saudi says, literally, your women folk are going to the dogs. He's asking the American, he's telling me. He said, did you read Dr. Kinsey's The Life of the American Female? Have you? The guy says, no. Have you read Masters and Johnson's? You Americans, man, you are great in writing things. Everything about your women folk, what, what happened and what the idiosyncrasies, every detail about them. Masters and Johnsons. Have you read it? He says, no. <laughs> what the hell you know, man? <laughs> <laughs> this Saudi, he bowls them over. He starts with another American. So you know I come from Saudi Arabia. And I'm a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrorist, is it? The terrorist? <laughs> you are a terrorist? Yes, you said, you know, you say you like to have too much terrorists, you know, to come along, see your Statue of Liberty and your New York and all that. Say, you mean tourists? He said, yes, true tourists, tourists. 
ترجمة <laughs> The brother spoiled it. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I brought it especially to give. But the brother spoiled the game, you see. So I said, no. That atom bomb fell the day Muhammad was born. Out of that data material of that bomb. Now I realize. You see, the enemy is telling me this. I didn't notice. I'm doing a job. Well, I just do a job. Because it's to be done. I am not that... Superman to start thinking, you know, I'm going to plan a strategy and I'm, you know, I'm going to use psychology, I'm going to use philosophy, and I'm going to use theology. Mm -hmm. An idea comes to me about what the Bible says about Muhammad. So I use a Quranic ayah. I start with the Quranic ayah from that data material. I start, every book of mine starts with an ayah from the Quran. I didn't know that this was the data material I'm taking from that. Data material of that bomb, Islamic bomb. I didn't know that. But now the Frenchman tells me that. I start this book. What the Bible says about Muhammad. Qula araaitum in kana min indillah wa kafartum bihi wa shahida shahidum min bani Israel ala mislihi. Fa amana wa stagbartum inna Allah la yahdi al-qawm al-zalimin. Surah Ahqaf, chapter 46, ayah number 10. I start. And I write my commentary. This book is my commentary. Next one, Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. It starts, starts, the book starts with, وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولِينَ يَعْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدِ And giving glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad, which is another name for Muhammad. Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse 6. My commentary. It's actually my commentary on that verse. Muhammad, the greatest. وَإِنَّكَ لَا أَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Surah Al-Kalam, chapter 68, verse 4. Now all these references, I say Al-Kalam. I quoted you Al-Kalam to start with. Kinoon wal kalami wa ma yasturoon ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon wa inna lak wa inna laka la ajarin ghayra mamnoon wa inna ka la ala khulukin azim. I started with that. And I'm telling you it is from Surah Al-Kalam. Now, I'm suggesting to my brothers and sisters that if anybody gives you any reference from the Holy Quran, make a point of going home and checking up. Not that you're doubting the speaker. That you have any reason to think that the speaker, the imam or whoever, has got any reason to deceive you. No, no, no. If you go home and check up these references, you see it with your eyes, read it with your heart and mind, and you try to grasp the meaning then that knowledge will become a part of your own property and you in turn will be able to share with others. So, from that point of view, I said, go home and check it up. And for that, you need a translation. You need a translation. I'm telling the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and the Bahrainis, I say, you Arabs, you need a translation. <laughs> Believe me, I tell them. I say, you Arabs, all of you, you need a translation. And you Iranians as well. You need a translation. Even if you understand Arabic. Even if you understand the Arabic of the Quran, you need a translation here in this country. <laughs> he said, why? I said, if you understand what I'm talking, what I'm talking to you now, you understand? Then you need a translation. If you don't understand me, then you don't need a translation. You get that? If you understand me, you need a translation. If you don't understand me, you don't need a translation. You know why? If you don't understand me, it means you don't understand English. So you don't need a translation. What are you going to do with a translation? <laughs> you understand me, that means you understand English. You need a translation. I tell you why. I carried out an, an experiment in Dharan University. The Saudi University, Dharan Oil, Oil Refinery University. I'm lecturing to the students. And I'm asking the students, how many of them know this Quranic ayah? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَاكِ وَتَحَرَكِ وَاسْتَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَلَمِينَ He said, how many of you know this ayah? 
So 80% of the students put up their hands. 80%. I said, are you a Hafizul Quran? He says, no. I said, those of you are Hafizul Quran, put your hands down. So quarter a dozen. They put their hands down. And you all, you know this verse? He says, yes, how do you know? You're not Hafiz? He says, no. Because that's his language. He's been reading, 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 and he's just imbibed it, he's just memorized. Tell him what you read. Come, come. The brother came. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa is qalat al-malaikatu ya Maryamu, inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki Allah nisa al-alameen. Right, he read it. Beautiful. I said, now, tell him, tell him. So, so you see, Maryam, Mary, Mary, uh, the angel came to Mary and tell her that, you know, you are very good, you are very nice, Allah will clean you, and he like you more than any other woman. So, astaghfirullah, what are you doing, man? You are murdering the Quran. You are murdering the Quran. You don't mean to. Allah won't punish you for that. But you are murdering it, man. This, Allah doesn't talk like that, like rubbish like that. This is you. You don't know the proper terminology, the pro proper construction of sentences, the proper vocabulary. You haven't got. So you're murdering the Quran. You're murdering the Quran in the translation. I says, now what you need? You need a translation. Here's one here. By Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Now, what you do, you, what you know already in Arabic, now I want you to memorize the English. Side by side, the Arabic you already know. He said, yes. So now memorize the English. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. So behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah has tafaki, Allah has chosen thee, wa taharaki, purified thee, wa tafaki, Allah nisa al-alameen, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Ya Maryamu knuti li rabbiki, was judi warka imar raqeen. So O Mary, worship thy Lord devoutly, prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. Thalika min anbai la ghaybi, nuhihi laika. This is part of the tidings of the things unseen, which we reveal unto thee, O messenger by inspiration. Come on, memorize the meaning. Once you have done that, I say, you know what you're achieving? You are learning new vocabulary, new construction of sentences, and sawab's blessings. I said, every time you meet an American, I said, how many Americans are around here? They said, 10,000 at the oil refineries, around Dharan. I said, you've got 10,000 customers. 10,000 customers. You, here, you got 200 million customers here. 200 million customers for that message. So you've got 10,000 customers. Every white man you see, whether he's a German or a French, or a British or an American, look, he must learn English to come and communicate with you. He must learn English before he comes here to do business with you. So you meet any white man, he says, good morning, sir, say, good morning. He says, you know, we believe in Jesus. He says, what? What do you want? In his mind, so what do you want? You want cigarette? Chocolate? What that? What is <laughs> no, 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 no. What, what, what is that? We believe in Jesus. You know, sir, we believe that Jesus is one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in his many miracles, including those of giving life back to the dead by Allah's permission, and of healing those born blind. So what is this, man? You know? He says, you know what the Quran says? He says, no. He says, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah has tafaki, Allah has chosen thee, wa taharaki, purified thee, wa tafaki. Go ahead, man, talk. Every time you read Allah's kalam in Arabic, you get ten, ten, ten sawabs. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, when you say alif, lam, mim, alif, lam, mim is not a word, there are three letters, and when you say alif, you get ten sawabs, lam, ten sawabs, blessings, and mim, ten sawabs, you got thirty. I got 30 and every one of you got 30, 30, 30, 30. You know that? It's to your credit. You say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. 19 letters. I got 190 sawabs, blessings, and every one of you got 190 to your credit. Man, do business with him. Beghaira hisab. Without calculation. Without keeping account. Let him keep the account. Let Allah keep the account. Says, go on, deposit it, man. Deposit it. While you're doing that, every time you rehearse the Quran, Sawab, sawabs. Every time you speak that English, you get more and more fluent. This new wordings, new construction of sentences. You don't talk like that. Behold, the angel said, and prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer. You don't talk like that, but you're learning new language. And this is sparkling. 
And every time you speak, I said, the tongue is the only edge tool which gets sharper with use. Every other tool with an edge, the screwdriver, you keep on using it, it gets blunt. The knife, every time you use it, the fork and the knife, man, every time you use it, it gets blunt. Over a period, the things need to be sharpened. You know that? The tongue is the only tool with an edge. The more you use it, the sharper, the fluenter it gets. It gets finer, finer. Go on, man. Blessings upon blessings. He said, where can we get this? Where can we get this? I said, well, look, I saw two in the library before coming over, in the library, in Dharan University. But if you want, you can write to WAMI, World Assembly of Muslim Youth, in Riyadh. They had sent me there. I said, inshallah, they will supply them to you. But everyone wants the Quran. You, my brothers, I don't know whether you are interested in this book. This is available outside, I understand. An encyclopedia of 2,000 pages. 2,000 pages of Arabic text translation and commentary with a very comprehensive index. Anything that you want to know. What does Allah say about heaven and hell and the H? You want to know about marriage in Islam and the M. Everything about marriage with whom you can and with whom you can't. How many, how many, how many? Go to that. About manners, manners and the M. About man, mankind. Hmm. Psychology of man. Things men covet. Things what they love most. What? What? I still want to give the book. Come on, tell me now. In the Quran, Allah says, the thing men covet most, what they love most. Come on, come on. Woman. Woman, <laughs> woman, woman, yes. Woman, woman. That's his. Good. I want to leave these books behind me. I don't know, you people are not helping me. Yes. I was asking the American Air Force men in the Dharan Air, 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 Air Base. I was lecturing to them. And I'm asking them, what does a man love most? And one American soldier first hit, he said, women! I said, did you read the Quran? He says, no. I said, man, you hit the nail on the head. No, no, Allah tells you that. He says, Fear in the sight of men is the love of things they covet. Number one, minan nisa, women, walbanin, sons. You know, I got 11 sons. I can make my own football team. How do I feel? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Walbanin. Number three, walkanatir il mukantarati minas zahabi wal fidda and hoarded heaps of gold and silver. That's come number three. Well, can I tell you that the people who are living in the world are living in the world, and the people who are living in the world are living in the world. Man, psychology of man. See the Quran. Do I have to prove it to you? People want to know why don't you allow women in the masjids? Yeah, yeah. I'm an official guide in my city. Why don't you people do? I don't see any women here. They ask, in the masjid, masjid is full? I says, no, in Islam, the obligation to pray is equally upon the man as well as the woman. But in the absence of a separate facility, they pray at home. But in this masjid of ours there, I said, look, there is a separate compartment, which is in the masjid, but it's out of the masjid. There's no free intermingling. That's all that Islam forbids is free intermingling. But the obligation is on the both, men as well as the women. So they want to know why? Why you, why you want to discriminate? I said, no, no, we're not discriminating. You see, this is for the protection. You see, the man, the, the psychology of man. I said, look, you have seen our evolution block. You now we have pool, and around that we have about 40 taps. And on Fridays, there's a queue behind every tap, half a dozen people, behind every tap. When it's finished, another one. Now when it's finished, another one. Because everybody comes along in the quickest, shortest time to fit themselves. But I says, now nah, look, instead of you making the ablution in front of me, it's your wife or your sister. She's making ablution, and I'm waiting for my turn. I said, while I'm waiting for my turn, I'm watching this woman. I can't help it, I can't keep my eyes closed. I'm watching her, she's washing her hands, and her face, and her arms. I said, what lovely arm she's got, and the nape of her neck. So, lovely, 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 man. You know, and the lovely tresses, you know, she's throwing around. I said, look, this is man, any man. Unless he's a hypocrite, or he's important. This is man. <laughs> then in our salat, I said, we stand shoulder to shoulder. And our Nabi Karim وسلم, he said that when you stand up for salat, you must not leave gaps for the devil to get in between you and your brother. 
I said, that devil he was talking about was not the guy we see in the art gallery. We have an art gallery, beautiful paintings by great artists. One of those great pictures is, you see a beautiful woman, well proportioned with wings. And she's got a wand in her hand, a stick, and she's directing the devil to go to hell. And you see the devil there in the picture, ready complexion, with horns, sharp ears, and a tail with a barbed hook. <laughs> and you see the fire in the distance. In the, in the picture you can show all that man. Beautiful painting. Hmm? Beautiful painting. And the devil is going to hell. He's also flying, but he's flying off. The angels directing him to go to hell. I said, a devil like that, if you see one, you run for dear life. Me too, me too. If I see a devil like that with horns, sharp ears, and a tail with a barbed hook, you know, <laughs> I say, I run for dear life. I said, you, me too. Right. So the devil Muhammad was talking about was not that devil. He was talking about you, yourself, your racial pride, your arrogance, your riches. I'm white, he's black. I'm rich, he's poor. That devil must not be allowed to come in between you and your brother. So we stand shoulder to shoulder. No gaps left. But instead of you, but instead of you, my brother, my sister, your wife, she's standing next to me. And I say, Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest. A nice, warm, cushy feeling. <laughs> my mind is wondering whether she's not the greatest. <laughs> this is man, any man. This is how Allah made us. Oh, that's how he made us. And we stand rows and rows behind each other. And your wife, your mother, your daughter standing in front of me there. And I say, Allah Akbar. Was it 36, 24, 36? <laughs> I said, this is man, any man, unless he's impotent or he is a lunatic, a lunatic of some kind. <laughs> so, I think I drifted off. I drifted off from the subject. Please forgive me. I lost, I lost my train. Right. Now, I think I'd rather leave it to you, my brothers and sisters. If you have any questions, please, please. Uh, I prefer questions from the floor because if my brothers... The ladies, I don't mind. They're sending notes. But you, my sons and my brothers, if you can't ask your uncle, that's me, your grandfather, that's me, can't stand up and ask a question, how are you going to give battle to the Nasara? I want to know. Huh? You can't stand before me, your uncle, your grandfather, and you're going to give battle to the Nasara, to the mighty American. Huh? Is it possible? <laughs> come on, come on. Whatever questions you have, please. Yes, my brother, yes. It says somebody said about the mic. Yes, somebody said about the mic. Yes. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I've been trying to ask you a question for three days. Oh, oh. <laughs> three days. The brother is waiting. He's got a chance now. Now, um, I I was uh, one day. Uh, giving dawah to a, she, she tried, a uh, Bongan Christian, she was trying to give me dawah. And uh, as you know, now they, they use red letter. Right, uh, red letter Bible. Uh, and I asked her, show me what Jesus uh, asked, I mean says, uh, that he is God. So she, she showed me Revelation. Um, or Revelation 1, when Jesus says, I am the first, I am the last, and uh, uh, I am the, the one that is living, and the one that dies, and something like that. And uh, that's what, like, she threw me off, you know. And, um, you know, I wanted to, 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 for you to explain to me, you know, like, uh, what this part that says that. Yes. And I don't believe it, but I mean, you know, yes, yes, kind yes, of yes, yes. You see that. In some of those red letter Bibles, red letter Bible means everything that Jesus is supposed to have spoken is in red. Now, if you get one of those Bibles, it's expensive, that everything that Jesus is supposed to have spoken is in red. Other than that, it's all black. And you'll find 90% of that Bible is black. Not even a red, red scratch in place. Not even a, that book of Revelation, almost as a whole, is all black. But now, this one is a trick that they have played. These are not the words of, of Jesus Christ. This is what the, the, the guy is thinking in the hereafter, he's going to hear all this. While he walked this earth, 
the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is there a single unequivocal statement where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me? See? While he walked this earth, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the canonical Gospels on which the canon, the faith of Christianity is based, supposed to be. Now, is there a single statement that he ever made in the three and a half years of his preaching where he says, I am God, Everybody says, worship me. There isn't. On the contrary, he says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. The word you hear are not mine, he says, but, but he that sent me. At everywhere, he says, I can do nothing of myself. He says, of that day, he says, no, but no man, no, not the angels, not the Son, but the Father in heaven. In my knowledge, I'm not like God. You know, in my power, I'm not like God. He says, all power is given unto me. It's not mine. It's an open thing. The man never claimed divinity. On the contrary, he says, worship the Father in heaven. Come, 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 I'll teach you how to pray. He says, pray like this. And he tells you how to pray. He said, oh, our Father, which art in heaven, ours, yours and mine, including Judas, the traitor, was there. He's the father of everybody, the good and the bad. So where does he say God is his father? Where? That his father and not your father. So you have to... Uh, inshallah. Next, next, next. Next, next. Next, Spanish to the... Spanish. Since there are going to be many brothers asking questions and requests, only ask the question and go to your seat. I really appreciate that. Please. Brother, come to this side. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum. I just have one question. I would like to know what, would you, what can you say to a Christian? that says that unless you're born of the water and of the spirit, by no means you shall enter the kingdom of heaven. That's the only question. Yes. Now, that is what Jesus is supposed to have told Nicodemus. See? See that is what he's supposed to have told Nicodemus. But now, one man in the Gospel of St. Matthew, that man who comes along and says, Good master, what good thing must I do to gain eternal life? What chapter, what reference, Hamza, if you remember? 12, verse, uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 14. Verse 14. Right. He, the, a learned Jew comes along to Jesus and master in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, Sheikh, Imam. What good thing must I do to gain eternal life? In answer to that, Jesus says, Why callest thou me good? There's none good except one, that is God. Alhamdulillah. I don't deserve to be called good. F forget calling me God. Don't even call me good. But, if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. Is that what he said? I'm sorry, Mark 10, uh, 10 17, 18, and I right. Mark 10, right. 17, 18. Right. But if thou will enter into life, life eternal, salvation, you want, keep the commandments. What are the commandments? Hmm? Just water, you just dip you and take you out. He says, keep the commandments. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did, not, did, we, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty works? Jesus, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The only one who does the works of my Father, what God tells you to do, you do, then you get Jannah, otherwise no heaven for you. Next one. <coughs> And one among the millions of Muslims who is uh, being inspired by you, I mean, uh, at, the, at this moment. Uh, my question is uh, about the religion. In many uh, of your videos I've seen you uh, say to Jesus that uh, Jesus uh, was a Jew or Moses was a Jew. But my understanding, either you correct it or confirm it, is that uh, Moses was a prophet of Allah. Jesus was a prophet of Allah, but none of them were Jews. All of them had been carrying the same message of Islam. It could be interpreted nowadays that he, he was a Jew or Judaism or Christianism, but none of them was Jew. Everybody was born Muslim, and they are carrying the message, the same message of Islam, maybe part by part. The last part revealed by uh, Muhammad sallallahu uh, Would you agree that our Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam was an Arab? Would you say Muhammad was an Arab? Was he an Arab? 
Yeah, right, right, right. He was an Arab. Now, does that make him not a Muslim? No, no. You see, Jew does not mean, what does it mean? To us, every prophet of God is a Muslim. <coughs> Meaning, one who submits his will to the will of Allah. Adam alayhi salam was a Muslim. Ibrahim alayhi salam was first of the Muslims. Muslims. Suleiman alayhi salam, Daud alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, every prophet of God is a Muslim. Meaning that they submitted the will to the will of Allah. But racially, what the blood, where did it come from? They say Abraham had two sons, Ismail and Ishaq. They say Ishmael and Isaac. The children of Ishmael, they say, are the Arabs, and the children of Isaac are the Jews. So all these prophets are the children from the children of Ishaq. So they are Jews. Racially, the blood, blood. When we say Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was an Arab, Hazrat Ali, what was he? He was an Arab. That doesn't mean he was not a Muslim. It means he belongs to that blood group from Ismail alayhi salam, and as such they are Arabs, and these are from Ishaq alayhi salam, they are Jews, but they are Muslims in faith, in belief. They are all the prophets of God are Muslims. Shad. When I talk to Christian, usually, uh, they quote me one verse in the Bible that, uh, that uh, Jesus said, uh, before Abraham was, I am. And, and it means to jump that now. Uh, and it means to jump that now. Jesus was God because he was created before uh, Abraham. Can you, uh, can you explain me? That? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Uh, the brother is asking that it is written in the Christian Bible, which the Christians are quoting him, that Jesus is God, because he said, before Abraham was, I am. I was before Abraham, before Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the Jews said, you are not 30 years old. And Father Abraham lived, you know, centuries before. How can you be before Abraham? So the Christian says, no, he's claiming to be God. That's what they're claiming. So now you use his own Bible, he said in the book of Jeremiah, if you know, in the book of Jeremiah, God speaks to Jeremiah the prophet, he says, I have made you a prophet, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Where was he? Before he was in his mother's womb, Allah says I knew, and I made you a prophet before you were born. What kind of a prophet is this? That sperm? That sperm, what? No, no, no. The reality of the person in the knowledge of God, Jeremiah was there, Ibrahim alayhi salam was there, Isa alayhi salam was there, our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi salam, he said, I was a prophet when Adam was between the water and the clay. You remember that hadith? I was a prophet when Adam was between the water and the clay. But he was born in history 1400 years ago. And Adam supposed to be born thousands of years ago. How can he be before? No, the reality of Muhammad was in, in the knowledge of God. He knew that his Rasul is going to send the last and final messenger he's going to send into the world. He knew he was going to send Jesus. He knew he was going to send Jeremiah. He knew there'll be a Hitler and there'll be a Mussolini and there'll be Saddam. All this thing is in the knowledge of God before Adam alayhi salam was born. Before Adam was born, all this thing is in his knowledge. In history they come up, but in the knowledge of God everything exists. That's what he's talking about. That before Ibrahim alayhi salam, I am. I was there before Ibrahim. In the knowledge of God, in the purpose of God. Not that he was there in this form at the age of 33 or what? What did he look like? Like a 12 year old? Or a little baby in his mother's arm? What did he look like there with the father? What was he like? Was he a man like this? And then Allah reduced him to a sperm and put it into his mother's womb and to start developing for nine months? What, 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 what are you talking about? So, in other words, this is all childish ideas that they have. You have to educate them that this is in the knowledge of God. Everybody was there. Each and every one of us was in the knowledge of God before Adam alayhi salam was born. Every one of us. We are there. Where? In his knowledge. Not this form. Not this shape. Not this size. Everybody is there. In his knowledge, he's all-knowing. For eternity, he knows everything. 
what's going to happen, what you're going to do, and everything he knew, but you were not in this form. Ah, wait now, we've got some questions from our sisters, we must do them justice. We have also what? communication with sisters, if you want they can ask uh, through microphone also. Yes, right, I'll just answer these yes. two, and then we'll ask them, yes, inshallah. Why did you say, talk to any white man? I think that is the terminology we use in South Africa. You see, South Africa, the, the, the white races, they had divided us into different racial groups. At first they said European, non-European. Everybody was either European or not European. And then they got, you know, a bit cleverer, then said white and non-white. So to me now, American! What is an American? Now, who are you talking about? You are talking about the Hispanic or the Afro-American? Or you also with the green card, everybody is also an American. The Pakistani is an American. Huh? I'm take it. No? The Iranian with the green card. Aren't you an American? You don't say, I'm an Iranian. They say, I'm an American. American citizen. So now, which American am I talking about? I'm talking about this mighty Texan. This mighty Texan is not a Pakistani or a Bangladeshi or an Iranian. He is white. So. Nothing, nothing. I have no other reasons for using the word white for this mighty Texans. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. How do you feel about the separation amongst Muslims? That is, Shiites, Sunni, NOI, Nation of Islam. How do you feel we can unite as one? To me, Anyone, anyone that is allowed for Hajj is a Muslim. I will recognize that person as a Muslim, I will talk to him as a Muslim. Whatever funny ideas he might have. He is allowed for Hajj. The Saudis recognize that you are a Muslim, I say, I recognize the guy as a Muslim. As soon as the Saudi says, no, the Iranians are not allowed. If they say they stop you from going for Hajj, that you are not a Muslim, then still I will talk to you. But not as a Muslim, I said, look, they say that you are not a Muslim, but now I must talk to you, whatever, now what is it, what makes them to say that? So I said, now look, that guy is saying such and such a thing that you don't believe in the Quran. You don't believe in this Quran. He said, you believe in another Quran. You know, there's so many parts missing here. He says, no, brother, I don't believe any nonsense like that. Right? I said, look, you have somebody, somebody else other than the Prophet Muhammad. He said, no, it was his Khatam al Nabiyin. So, man, if you believe in this Quran, if you believe in Allah and our Nabi as a Khatam al Rasul, between me and you, no problem. Anybody else, you say you are a Muslim, you believe in Allah, and his Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger of God, anything else I'm prepared to tolerate. Anything else from anybody. Any nonsense, any silly ideas you have, I'm prepared to tolerate you and talk to you. I won't disqualify you. Say, so you are not a Muslim. You believe in Allah, the one and only? He said, yes. And you believe in his Prophet Muhammad as the last and final messenger of God? He said, yes. That's right. You are my brother. Let's talk now. So that's my... Any sisters now, if they want to use the mic, they can ask the question. I will answer. I have a question for one of the sisters. He writes that, my colleagues at work usually talk of visiting and say that Jesus will forgive my sins. As a Muslim, I want to convince them, please give references from the Holy Quran, which should refute it, or how to answer them. The Quran tells us, says, Wala taqulu thalasa. Don't say Trinity. This is stop it, it'll be better for you. Innam Allahu ilahum wahid, for your Allah is one Allah. He is not three in one. But now the Christian says there is a Holy Trinity. He believes that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But there are not three gods, but one God. He says in his catechism, in his catechism, in his book of reference for his deen, he said the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It continues. The catechism, it continues. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But they are not three persons, but one person. That's what he's talking. Now, we are thinking that whatever he's talking makes sense, because that's his language. It's the most nonsensical statement the guy is talking about. The silliest thing. Person, 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 but not three persons, but one person. I'm asking the Britishers and the Americans, what language are you talking? <laughs> what language is this? 
person, person, person. But not three person, but one person. I said, what language is that? English? I said, that's not English, that's gibberish. <laughs> I said, you and your brothers, two other brothers are identical triplets. We can't make out the difference between the three of you. You all look identical. Hmm? If one of you commit murder, I said, can we hang the other? He says, no. I said, why not? You all look alike. <laughs> huh? He said, no, he's a different person. I said, what makes him a different person? What makes him different? His personality. I said, right. Now, the personality of the father is different from the son, unless your mind is diseased. When you say in the name of the father, you are thinking of the old father Christmas, Santa Claus, sitting on some planet, with his feet dangling onto the earth as his footstool, the heaven as his canopy, the loving father in heaven, right? That's what he said, father in heaven. He is an old father Christmas, Santa Claus, sitting on some planet. When you say God the son, I said, what are you thinking of? A prize bull or a false wacha? What? No, a handsome young man, like uh, we saw Jeffrey Hunter, Jeffrey in the King of Kings, you know, he acted in that film. You know, handsome young man, blonde hair, blue eyes, right? That's Jesus. And, and the God, this Holy Ghost, he said, came like a dove when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist. So you have three mental pictures. The Father is different, the Son is different, and the Holy Ghost is different. And howsoever hard you try, you can never superimpose those three pictures and create one. There will ever be three in your mind. You can never create one picture out of the three. Father is different, Son is different, and the Holy Ghost is different. And you say they are one. Which way they are one? So, all right, let's say, let's say, let's, um, let me agree with you. They are all one. Indivisible, indivisible. So, I say when the Son died, the Father and the Holy Ghost also died with Him. <laughs> they are all one, inseparable. So when one dies, the other that two dies also. Huh? When one is crying, the other guy is also crying. He must be, because all one. <laughs> it's the most nonsensical religion on earth, but the guys are getting converts because they are talking, and you and I, we are not getting converts. I'm asking, why? Why? You give me an answer, I give you a book. Why? The, the Jews and the, I'm sorry, the Christian, with all the in the Bible, it's worth going through to handle the guy, to deal with him. It is said, al hirbu khit'un, war is strategy, and strategy demands that you use the weapons of your enemy. Strategy demands, if this guy has got a scud missile, you need an anti petroid something better than that, or at least a scud by scud. You can't fight with the guns. Huh? You need something equal to that. So now, you have to arm yourself with the type of knowledge from his book to overturn him. But now, I said, that Christian is getting converts with this book. And if I give you examples from this book, time, 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 time has gone so much. There's a limit to every good thing. So we have to come to a stop. But now, this answer, the Christian is getting converts. Just as a chance right. That book first, I give my sisters a chance. This beautiful book in my hand here, I know you can't see it, but it's gold embossed, maroon color, hard cover, 250 pages. It's yours, my sisters. If you tell me, why is it that the Muslim is not getting converts with the Quran, but the Christian is getting converts with the Bible? Why? No, no, no. I want to know why is it that we are not getting converts with the Quran and the Christian is getting converted with that Bible which is full, full of so much filth and rubbish that so many countries were talking about banning the book. Portions of this Bible was banned in my country. No, not, another one, another one, another one. That's not it. Yes. No. My sisters, my sisters, give them a chance. My sisters. Lack of invitation. Are you the girl? We don't practice the You're not a woman. Ladies only. My sisters, please. Huh? What's that? We don't? No, 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 no. Something simple, my sister, very simple. 
I don't want to make things hard for you people. We read the Quran, but we don't understand it. No, 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 no. Another reason. Simpler than that. All right. I give you my brothers a chance. The young people. We are not talking. We are not talking. You don't open your mouth. That's the trouble. You don't open your talk, man. Talk. Find any excuse to talk. You don't talk. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, Deliver the message regarding me, even if it is one verse. Talk, man, talk. Just give that one thing that you know, talk about it. Talk about it. And Allah will add up more to you. Wa akhirud dawana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.